you should also be able to access closed captioning. My name is Jacqueline Francis. I'm the chair of the graduate program in visual and critical studies at California College of the Arts. I'm a black woman with tan brown skin and freckles and light brown hair. I'm sitting in an office with painted white walls upon which some event posters hang. California College of the Arts campuses are located in Wichin and Yalamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, cities on the unceded territories of Chochenyo and Ramayatush Ohlone peoples, who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous peoples in California and the Americas, including their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. CCA honors indigenous peoples, past, present, and future here and around the world, and we wish to pay respect to local elders. Today, Wednesday, October 13, 2021, the Visual and Critical Studies Graduate Program Forum welcomes scholar, educator, and activist, Dean Spade of Seattle University. Professor Spade's talk is also a program of the Creative Citizens Law, Creative Citizens Series at CCA, annual public programs focused on creative activism. Our current VCS graduate students, Liz Ordway and Venmi Mareba Clova Collins, will introduce Professor Spade and moderate the Q&A and discussion. Before they take up these tasks, please allow me to say some contextualizing words about the VCS Forum series. The VCS Forum convenes regularly throughout the academic year. The Forum opens dialogues and contemporary issues in the visual arena. Students and faculty have the opportunity to engage with leaders in a range of creative and scholarly fields, including visual studies, literary criticism, cultural studies, journalism, film studies, design, history, architecture, cultural practices, and fine arts. BCS forums are free and open to the public, and of course, to all members of the CCA community, including our esteemed alumni. During the fall 2021 semester, we will host the VCS forums on Zoom. For more information, please search VCS forum on the CCA portal page. That's portal.cca.edu. There you'll find information about our next speaker, Professor Eric Stanley of the University of California at Berkeley, who will join us on Wednesday, October 20th at 5 p.m. Professor Stanley's topic is clocked, surveillance, opacity, and the image of force. Now I'll turn it over to Wenmi to introduce Professor Dean Spade. Um, hello, everyone. It's our pleasure to welcome Dean Spade, a lawyer, writer, and activist. He's currently a professor at Seattle University School of Law. Um, his work centers queer and trans liberation through the lens of racial and economic justice. In his body of work, it's evident that collaborative projects take precedence. He's practiced mutual aid through projects like the Big Door Brigade and the Sylvia Rivera Law Project. Um, he has great dexterity moving between various approaches to political organizing, such as articles, interviews, podcast appearances, blogs, zines, and documentary film. His two books, Normal Life, Administrative Violence, Critical Trans Politics, and the Limits of the Law, published in 2011, and Mutual Aid, Building Solidarity During This Crisis and the Next, published in 2020, hone in on the importance of grassroots activism and mutual aid in order to bring collective care for those most at risk. He questions the authority of legal reform when it often doesn't address root causes of harm and can even further expose vulnerable communities to violence. He argues that mutual aid is a crucial though overlooked part of mobilizing resistance. I'm sure that the class and the guests can all agree that we're thrilled to have you and are especially eager to hear you speak about how you navigate all of these different channels for activism. Thank you for your time and we're honored to introduce Dean Spade. Thank you for that generous introduction and for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here with all of you. Um, yeah, um, I live on Duwamish land in Seattle, Washington. Um, and um, I really appreciated the visual description that uh, Jacqueline gave at the beginning. So I will say that I am, um, I have a, 
yellowish wall behind me and some flowers. I'm a white um, person with short, dark hair and a mustache and a blue denim shirt. And I'm gonna share some slides and I'm gonna try to also keep describing the images that I am um, sharing. And I wanted to say that, uh, you know, I'm not a visual artist and you can tell from my slides. <laughs> so I am sorry that the design is limited. I'm also just alert. I'm also just shifting personally as a person who's a million years old from using PowerPoint to using um, Google Slides. And so it's even worse than it should be. <laughs> um, but anyway, I first wanted to share this image I love about that is an image about mutual aid made by an artist named Roger Pete. I'm going to put where you can find his work in the chat. Um, this image of sunflowers that says solidarity in the middle. And then it says, um, we uh, we are all we really have. I just feel is such a profound, it's, you know, kind of a typical slogan in um, a lot of the resistance movements I'm part of. We're all we have, we're all we need, but it feels so profound in the sort of disastrous times we're living in and simultaneously terrifying and also really hopeful. And I just, uh, I, I take a lot of inspiration from it. Let's see if I can make these slides advance. We'll see. Okay, so I wanted to just first share a few images of some mutual aid projects that I follow closely and um, some of which I've collaborated with or think are particularly interesting. Um, this is an image from the work of Street Watch LA. Um, this is an image of somebody manning one of their charging um, station or personing one of their charging stations um, where people who are um, living in, in encampments of unhoused people in different places in LA. Street Watch LA has done various kinds of support for people living in those encampments and one of them is providing people with a place to power up their um, phones and other devices, which can be a really difficult um, access need for people who are unhoused. Um, so this is uh, just an image of people doing that work and they're also giving out water and snacks and other things people might need. Um, this is an image um, from January, 2020 of um, organizers, some of whom are from Street Watch LA and other groups in Echo Park in Los Angeles blocking um, sanitation trucks. The city was coming to clear out and sweep the encampment of unhoused people in Echo Park and people blocked those sanitation trucks and they did this over and over again. Um, here's another image of people blocking those same yellow sanitation trucks in Echo Park in Los Angeles. I'm very moved by the, by people just putting their bodies in front of these trucks and it actually worked for a long time. The city, the, the, the activists had the schedule of when the city planned the sweeps and then they would um, um, block, go block the sweeps and it was successful for a long time the city left um, the, um, the encampment in Echo Park alone. Um, and then in March of 2021, um, the city of Los Angeles spent over a million dollars to raid the um, the encampment in Echo Park, which had had a lot of mutual aid around it, like people had developed a way to have solar showers there and people had given out people tents and there was gardening happening and there was just a lot of really deep um, mutual connection and support and community happening in that space for unhoused people and the cops, city spent a million dollars for the cops to raid it. And um, there was a plan to, for, to turn out a lot of people and try to stop the cops, but when they brought this level of militarized, militarized presence, um, it could not, they were, the, the police were successful and they raided it and they put a fence entirely around the 16 acre park, which also made like, it made, meant like street vendors didn't get to work there anymore. Like tons and tons of community needs to get to, don't get to happen there now. Um, so yeah, so I'll just say like, that's happening a lot. Like one of the areas in, in which, uh, I I'm seeing just like an enormous amount of, um, Mutual aid work is around people living outside, um, which is happening more and more. I'm sure you all are aware, like housing costs are so high and um, wages are so low. And, um, you know, just like the racialized geographies of our cities, like people, a lot of people are living without shelter. And that's an area where I think we see both like kind of, you know, mutual aid that's about food and water and charging and also mutual aid that's about like get trying to get in between the police and people they're trying to hurt. Um, and in a lot of places, I think we're at a really interesting crossroads where these um, defenses of encampments have not yet really been successful. Like people are turning people out and, and but what, a, like, like in the Seattle area, what they're doing right now is just trying to like help people clean up their stuff so they don't lose their prescription meds and their prescription, their prescription glasses, and like other basic things they need in their documents. But I think I like to imagine like, what would it be like if 
all of us participated in this work and the cops just couldn't come and raid people and you know push them to another park in another part of town or whatever it is that this kind of like pointless constant shuffling of people who are um made homeless by a um by a housing system that we have i want to share a few background assumptions that i come into this talk with in case they're not familiar to you and then you can we can talk about them at the end if you want to like if any of these but just like i just thought since i'm just jumping into this stuff about mutual aid, maybe I should just share like some basic things I believe that might help explain why I'm saying things the way I'm saying them. Um, so the first one is that I believe that social change comes from organizing by millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people, not from charismatic leaders, corporate media coverage, elected officials, courts, or legislatures. So like fundamentally, that is a pretty different idea than the one we're served. Like, I don't think that like, if we elect the right people, if we have the right people in Congress, or if we like get the right article in New York Times, or if um, we get the right case before the court that we will win. Um, and that is because I think that this, all of the systems I just named, the electoral system, the court and legal system, the corporate media system, all of it is organized towards, you know, white supremacy extraction and um, settler colonialism and heteropatriarchy. So, um, so yeah, so it's like, a fundamental belief of mine is that people power is the only thing that changes things. Um, and that if it appears that any of those things change, they're just responding um, when they are forced to by uh, sufficient disruption by people. The second kind of basic assumption of mine is that local networked autonomous projects grounded in local knowledges are better at responding to crisis and disaster um, and building methods of collective self-determination. So there's like a pretty normal assumption, I think, in like the contexts that I live in, like in US culture, that what we should be trying to build is like, like it's more important if you build like a big national organization and that like, you know, it's like the ACLU is more important than like the local mutual aid group in your town, kind of like that you should be, everything should be like moving towards like doing things to scale, people often say, and it imagines like some kind of like we could have a solution to policing that we roll out in every city. Um, and I think that's not um, how it works. I think that um, our experience shows that um, people like people have the most collective self-determination and can actually meet the conditions as they are on the ground in very local ways. And so that people like living in a um, immigrant neighborhood are gonna have a different response that's gonna make sense for them that, than the people like, you know, over here living in this other space. And that like um, local wisdom is essential for responding to disasters. And that's why things like FEMA like don't work as I'm sure you've noticed. Um, I mean, it's one of the many reasons why like state and federal disaster relief doesn't work. Um, also it's not designed to work, it's designed to facilitate extraction and, um, you know, uh, gentrify and all of these things. Um, it, um, but, uh, you know, that what really does work is when lots and lots of people are copying each other's tactics, but doing it like, like learning from each other's lessons learned, but like doing it our own way in lots of small autonomous groups and having a lot of shared decision making instead of having like some executive director somewhere at the top of whatever, you know, scaled up thing, tell us how it is. Um, oh, what happened? Okay. Um, and then the third assumption is that um, I believe that starting with the survival of the most stigmatized people is the most pragmatic approach. It's very annoying that we even have to say that at this point, but like we live in a culture which it's like, you know, let, maybe we should let people out of prison who don't have criminal, who don't have, you know, aren't charged with violent crimes, or maybe we should have let immigrants come in who like have never had contact with the criminal legal system or who are graduates of universities. Like there's this desire consistent desire to take less stigmatized people and shape our struggles around them, um, which reinforces stigma and the hierarchies we live under. And it's really not pragmatic because if you fix things for people who are in the most complex, difficult conditions, it, it fixes things for people who are in less complex, difficult conditions, but the reverse does not like trickle down is like not a thing. Um, things don't trickle down. So, um, so yeah, so that's like just another central belief I have. And I think most mutual aid, tends to be organized this way. Like mutual aid usually is like people are like, oh, these people are falling out. Like no one's covering this. No, there's nowhere to go if you're like this, if you've been kicked out of the shelters or if you, um, you know, if you're a person who has the uh, uh, criminal record so you can't access this, right? like most mutual aid is like people doing volunteer-based projects for those people who have, are, the, are the stigmatized people who have fallen out. Um, and I think that that's for a reason because that's actually ethical. Um, okay. So that's some background stuff. So what do I mean by mutual aid in case that's new to you? 
Um, I mean, you know, that word, th that term can be used by a lot of people to mean different things. So I'll just say what I mean by it. I mean, it's the work we do in our social movements that provides material support for people to survive existing systems. So people in crisis, like I, I'm unhoused or I um, have a medical need that's unmet or um, whatever my, you know, I'm facing violence, whatever. And it's, it's when that work is based in a shared awareness of the root causes of the crisis. So we believe that the system caused this person to be in crisis, not that the person is at fault for being in crisis. And the third element for me is that it includes an invitation to collective action. So it's like, oh, your landlord like is like, you know, trying to kick you out of the building. Yeah, let's, we want to go to housing court with you and like try to get you to stay in or we want to go protest the landlord's house with you or whatever. And are you interested in joining? Like we're trying to organize all the tenants in the building or all the tenants on the block or all the tenants in the city or whatever. And you don't have to accept that invitation to collective action to to get our help right now, but that invitation is inherently part of it, is the belief that collective action is the way through these conditions, not just one individual case after another. Oh, I'm going back. Okay. Um, the second piece of mutual aid that I think is kind of basic essential is that um, mutual aid is a way to politically participate that's based in care and action. And we are really encouraged to politically participate when we get angry or scared at the systems, you know, ways things are to just do stuff that's symbolic, like post up on social media, you know, vote, go to a march once a year. Like we're really encouraged to like make very individualized gestures that are very limited and not to join up with other people and be like a force of material change. So mutual aid is a different, it's a different kind of invitation to political participation that I think most people are hungry for, but also maybe haven't heard of um, because we've really been told like, if you just vote enough, it'll work out. Or if you just, you know, so, social media post enough, it'll work out and it's not working out. Um, and then the third piece is that mutual aid builds actual safety and well-being and survival and lets us recover for and prepare for and recover from disasters, which is really important because just to be totally real, um, that's what our lifetimes are going to be about is just, um, they already are, but it's just going to be the continual unfolding of um, disasters related to climate change and everything that relates to that, plus like the ongoing disasters we've been living for generations, the disaster of this criminalization system, the disaster of a capitalist housing and healthcare system, the disaster of settler colonialism, like we're living in those disasters and everything's getting exacerbated by like sharpening um, global maldistribution of wealth and resources and by um, the disasters produced by climate change. And so we have to meet that and um, the systems that we live under are not going to take care of us or, you know, they just keep failing and letting the same people over and over be the victims of that stuff, be the ones who die of COVID, be the ones who die in the hurricane, who freeze in the snow, whatever it is. And so um, we need to build actual systems like what would keep our neighborhood safe when the hurricane's coming or what would what do we what do we think would be proper preparation for the wildfires or what do we think, you know, like that, as opposed to hoping that the you know system is going to just provide something that it's like designed to not provide, except for to the, you know, very few um, people who are its beneficiaries. Important distinction that I think is like really essential because we live in a culture that has a really strong charity narrative. Um, charity is like a system that's like, um, it's like a whole logic that says like, um, you know, rich people should like break off crumbs from their wealth. Rich people are rich because they're the smartest people obviously, and they should be, um, should break up crumbs of their wealth and give it to poor people. Um, and it kind of, you know, rich, the kind of charity model we have in the U.S. like stems from like a Christian charity model in Europe that was like pay alms to the poor to like get into heaven kind of thing. So it's like you prove you're deserving this as a rich person by like, you know, giving these crumbs to poor people. And it's about like, um, saving, blaming, and controlling poor people. Like, um, you know, oh, they're, they're, there's something wrong with them for being poor. And then the ones who are like a little better should get like a little something and survive. Um, kind of like, a, you know, um, something that justifies the system. Like, like the rich people aren't bad for hoarding all the wealth. Look, we've been so good to the poor, the kind of thing. Um, and, you know, charity programs and social service programs are really controlling. They're like, you have to be sober to be here. You have to take these meds. You have to do this with your, you know, to take this parenting class. You have to take this budgeting class. You have to, you know, like it's all about assuming there's something wrong with poor people and that's why they're poor as opposed to that they're poor because rich people are extracting and exploiting. And charity tends to do this thing of identifying the deserving poor. So it's like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, you know, 
you can't come live here unless you can prove that you're sober, unless you can prove that you take the meds we think you should take, or unless you can prove that you're straight, or unless you can prove that you've never engaged in this or that type of work or whatever. Um, and ultimately the charity model is system sustaining and we're trying to destroy these systems, right? So mutually it's kind of the opposite of charity. It's all, it, 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 the only similarity is that it does something that meets immediate needs, but mutual aid, you know, to charity tends to meet the immediate needs of, the, of less stigmatized people. Mutual aid's focused on more stigmatized people. First, um, charity is system sustaining. Mutual aid is um, interested in dismantling the system to get rid of the, the crises that it causes. Um, so yeah, some basic mutual aid principles, the system, not the people suffering under it is what creates poverty, crisis and vulnerability. You know, like there's an idea in the US that if you're homeless, it's because like you've done something wrong. Like you, like you're, there's something wrong with you <laughs> like, or you're choosing it. I mean, these are literally the ideas, right? Um, homeless people are these undesirable people who are like in someone's neighborhood and they have to clean them up and call a cop, you know, like this whole framework as opposed to like people are living outside because of a system that produces housing for profit. Like there's empty housing and there's people living outside. Like, what's up? Um, mutual aid believes in a commitment to dignity and self-determination of people in need or crisis so that it's like, um, we really care what people in crisis say would be helpful instead of telling them what they need, what they need, which is what like most charity and, you know, kind of, especially a picture like international NGOs who like go to countries and are like, you guys need abstinence only sex education. And people are like, that's not true. We need condoms and we need like clean drinking water and we need meds, which you deny us and you know, whatever. Right. So just this kind of like, it's, it's really interested in like the, um, that people in crisis actually know a lot about um, what they need to be well and safe. Mutual aid includes people making long-term commitments to the work. So I think this is really significant. I think a lot about like um, after the uprising in Baltimore, after Freddie Gray was killed by the police, people started this court, uh, this jail support mutual aid project that was like um, people would hang out outside the jail on a schedule and anyone who was released, they would try to help them like get what they needed. Like, do you need a ride somewhere? Do you need to make a call? Like, do you have clothes warm enough for the season we're in now? Like, do you need help accessing your meds, applying for benefits? Like people often get rearrested quickly when they're released from jail because they're released with nothing and very dangerous conditions. And so like that kind of project, it's like, you're making a long-term commitment. It's like, yeah, I'm, I agree to do the shift every Tuesday at two, you know, or people who do childcare collectives or people who are doing court support for people going through long court proceedings or who are gonna like, you know, be doing, you know, supporting people who are going through housing court to stop evictions or supporting people to protest landlords who aren't um, doing things right or employers who are not paying people wages. Like you like get, you get in the weeds in a mutual aid project. You're like, we are going to like keep doing this. It's not like, oh, I volunteered on Thanksgiving. I'm happy, you know, just kind of like the charity model. Like once a year I show up and have it take a selfie in front of something. Like this is like long-term commitment. Like I'm gonna do this work with other people for years, even when it's hard. Um, mutual aid, you know, a central principle of mutual aid is, is like a lot of people join movements this way. Like, like the main way I think historically that people have joined social movements is through mutual aid. Either it's like, I'm in crisis and this group is providing something. They're the only group where I can get this thing. And so I go there and show up and I'm like, oh, they're, they say that it's, they say that it's messed up that I don't have that and that everybody should have that. And I get into conversations with them about that. And then I'm like, this is compelling. I agree. We should have this. I'm going to join the work. I'm going to like, now I'm going to also become part of other parts of the organizing. Or I want to also help people get this breakfast that I got or get this bike fixed that I got fixed or whatever. Right. Um, or people join movements often by joining mutual aid projects because they're they're hearing about something that's happening that's messed up or it happened to someone they love or it happened to them before and they want to help people. Like it's just this really like kind of human instinct, I think, that people, when we're pissed and scared about what's going on, we want to help. And so mutual aid projects are this on-ramp into social movements. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we need really big social movements really badly to conquer what's happening. Um, and so we need uh, mutual aid projects to build themselves knowing this, which means we don't need like three of us to start this project and be super controlling and never let anyone else in and then burn out. It's great that we delivered those meals for a few months, but like, it's not movement building. It's like, how can we help more people get in here? I wanna have a caveat that of course, sometimes you're doing mutual aid work that's illegal and you need to have a more secure, like you might be like, oh, we're actually trying to get people these meds that are like illegal in our state, or we're trying to like help these people cross a border or something that's risky. And so sometimes you, some mutual aid groups are not places that have big open meetings and pathways for new people to join. But most mutual aid groups could be more like this or are trying to do this. Um, okay. 
a couple other principles. One, political education, like when you join mutual aid groups, you know, like because you are in need of something and they're providing it or because you want to help people or whatever, a lot of times, like we have a pretty limited view of like the problem. It's like whatever, I, like, oh, like I'm upset about like kids being incarcerated on the border. But like, then I join the group and people are like, telling me more stuff. I'm like, oh, I never thought about, I also don't think adults should be caged. And then I'm like, oh, maybe also, I didn't know that like the incarceration system, the immigration um, and uh, border enforcement system is like super anti-black. I never thought about the specific vulnerabilities of black people in the system. Or I never thought about the specific vulnerabilities of people with disabilities. Or, you know, you just, when you're in the work, your solidarity grows. Like whatever interested you at first, or like, you're like, oh, I'm here because I'm pissed. I got evicted. And then you're like, oh, I met some other people. And I found out like, what it's like to be evicted if you're an immigrant, which is different. Or I found out about like, I didn't actually think I, I thought I hated queer and trans people, but then there's some of them in the group. And now I think realize actually that, that was mistaken. Like people, we grow when we do this work because every space is a space of an intense difference. There's lots of different people there figuring things out together. And some mutual aid groups do explicit, you know, political ed. Like we're going to have a movie night where we learn about the history of other groups like ours that have done this work in this city. And some groups or, you know, we're going to have a training on disability justice for our group. And some groups, it's also just happening organically. Like, I'm going to sit at that charging table with you all day. We're going to find out stuff that the other one doesn't know about our politics. Like, we're just going to grow because we're sitting here all day being like, so why are you here? Why do you care about unhoused people? And then inevitably, we're going to grow. So political education is fundamental practice inside mutual aid and intention of mutual aid groups. Pretty important principle in mutual aid work is like humility and willingness to accept feedback. Mostly all mutual aid work is being done volunteer. People are doing this work because we want to do it. Um, I should say this, you know, it's very important to realize that if you're only going to do social justice work that you get paid for, you are only going to do work that rich people would pay for or the government would pay for. So it's, there's no chance we can do the amount of movement work we need <laughs> uh, only paid by them. And whatever they pay for is really constrained by their funding regimes, right? Like they don't like to fund work that's more uh, transformative. So um, since we're all doing this work, mostly volunteer, we have to not dominate each other. And it's not like other workplaces or even families or spaces where somebody's the boss. It's like, no, we have to be like, I'm willing to hear your ideas because I need you to stick around and do this with me and not, nobody's making you, you don't have to. <laughs> so that means we have to get these skills that we that are pretty underdeveloped in a society that's highly hierarchical um, where we're used to either being bossed around and keeping our heads down or trying to boss people around. Um, so instead we have to learn humility and the ability to give and receive feedback. Um, which is huge and very hard in a society organized around punishment and prisons where we're all pretty afraid, like if we do anything wrong, we'll be rejected or cast out or punished. And we're afraid of telling anyone they've done something that hurt us or that we didn't like because it feels so high stakes, like they're gonna be super defensive because everyone's afraid of being cast out. So these are like really important skills that um, most of us need to learn and a lot of groups I work with do like workshops on giving and receiving feedback. It's one of the kinds of workshops that I facilitate for groups because it's so new for most of us to have. Most of us only get feedback in like terrible high stakes situations like you're in trouble at work or at school or with your parents, you know, or whatever space you're in. Relatedly, we need a lot of conflict resolution skills to do this work because if you do anything that you care about with others, um, you'll have conflict. Um, conflict doesn't mean that anyone's done something wrong. It's just like, yeah, we're gonna see it differently. We're gonna disagree. It's gonna come up that we have these identity positions that have like trained us to act with each other in particular ways that we're not aware of. So yeah. Um, conflict will come up and having skills around that can also be preventative skills, like knowing how to say something when I'm frustrated instead of letting it build up until I blow up or leave, you know, things like that. Um, I'm actually doing some workshops like that coming up um, through Barnard. Maybe someone could put it in the chat for me. Like this, there, there's like a series of four workshops over four months that are sliding scale 
Um, I think that they might be called no masters, no flakes or something. Um, anyway, if, if you don't find it, I'll find it after I give this talk. Um, but they might be useful if anybody's in a group or if wants to do this kind of work to kind of get more into the nitty gritty of some of those skills. A lot of these groups, mutual aid groups really value transparency, um, meaning like we actually know if there's money, how it came in and how it went out, who's making decisions and how. This is not how like the institutions that we're used to working in and going to school in work. So it's a pretty big deal to, um, to actually have transparency and it prevents conflict and it, um, it prevents like disorganization as well. Um, so that's like a pretty central value and it's definitely not valued by nonprofits or charities or social service organizations. Like try to find out how much the ED gets paid, you know, um, and how little like the receptionist gets paid. Um, Finally, this is implied in what I was already saying, but a lot of mutual aid groups and other kinds of social movement groups these days have you know, come to the awareness that hierarchical decision-making methods really leave us very vulnerable, both to like abusive people on top and to like infiltration. Like there's such a deep history in the 1960s and 70s movements. A lot of groups used a kind of military type hierarchy in their organizations which made sense because they were trying to articulate like an anti-racist, anti-colonial politics where they said we're at war with the US and, and we're gonna you know, destroy it, which is great. Um, but that hierarchical way of organizing made them very vulnerable to abusive people being at the top because of course we're all inheriting these things we've learned from this society and to like law enforcement infiltration just capturing key people or putting key people who are agents in place. And so a lot of us have learned that a better way to make decision making, that to make decisions is to actually share it. And so that there isn't like somebody on top bossing us all around. Um, and it's also better than like majority rule because if we're in a group and we go with majority rule, then it could be that like people without disabilities outnumber people with disabilities. So they win the vote. But like, don't we all want this group to be working like a good place for people who have disabilities to do the work together or people without kids could outvote people, you know, or whatever, like what does majority have to do with it? Like we, what we want is for the best ideas that meet our values and that actually may come from people who are in the minority in a particular experience or identity because they may be the ones noticing like how we're not living our values or something that we're missing because it's affecting them. So, you know, consensus-based decision-making is very pragmatic in this way. It's like anyone can bring a proposal and then everybody can talk about what they are worried about or could we tweak it this way? Could we tweak it that way? And everybody's wisdom can come into the proposal until it's like we've massaged it and it's better. And then we can all be like, yeah, we could live with that. And that is different than like, I bring a proposal and we vote yes or no. And I'm like, it's my proposal and I'm mad if anyone votes no on it. I'm leaving the group if you guys don't do what I say. Like, so we have to kind of become different kind of people to be able to do that well. Most of us are not that good at that yet. Um, and I think that the skill here is desiring others participation. Like, what's it like for me to be like, I'm gonna bring this idea to the group tonight and I'm looking forward to hearing from people about what I missed because then the idea is gonna get better. And it also, I don't really need my favorite thing to get through. I can live with like pretty good and compromise with others so that we get the work done and so that we're all behind it instead of I win my way, but like five people left the group and now we don't even have enough people to implement this, which is I think that when we're kind of harsh towards each other, how that can be. There's a lot of great materials out there about consensus decision-making. I'm gonna talk about that in those workshops if this is something you wanna like go deeper on. Um, Couple other points um, quickly, but I'm also trying to speak slower thanks to someone who reminded me of that. Um, you know, a lot of people, I think during COVID, I had this conversation a lot, I mean, during the beginning of COVID and, and also I've had this a lot about um, climate-based disasters like hurricanes and fires. You know, there's this like, but don't we need like the state to do this care? Like, don't we need, mutual aid will never be able to cover it. We're too small. The state's the only thing that has the capacity. I think there's a couple of things in there. I think there is a fantasy of a caregiving state 
that for me just is, can, cannot be squared with the reality of what the US state is and has always been and how it meets disaster, which is like with guns drawn. And like, if you're lucky and you're a homeowner, you get a loan after the hurricane. And if you were unhoused, you're out of luck. I recommend Naomi Klein's work as like an easy place to find out more about why disaster relief um, has consistently not worked with also many, many other scholars and, um, and writers and activists. Poor relief and disaster relief in the US has always been conditional, exclusive, and quickly revoked. So it's like, you can only get this if you had this kind of job before COVID. These people can't have it. And uh oh, we think you guys aren't willing to work enough now. We're taking the relief back, even though you're all still out of work and unhoused. <laughs> you know, like it's it's used to control people. So obviously, I have spent my life fighting for people's welfare benefits and hearings and stuff. It's important to try to get it for individuals in the moment, but it cannot be our answer. It's designed to be insufficient. And so even when people say this thing like, but we, but mutual aid can never be to scale, um, that's because right now we live under a government that takes everything from everyone and then leaves people like in extreme suffering and with extreme falsely created scarcity so that a few people can make a shitload of money off of us. And then we think that the only solutions can come from them, even though it, that's like not designed to ever produce those solutions. So we need to both like dismantle that thing that takes everything from us and actually produce the ways of life we can live. And I think there's a lot of ways people are doing that. Um, one thing I'll say about this is that while we're fighting these fights, we do of course always acknowledge when there's concessions, like it's awesome that there was an eviction moratorium ever, <laughs> you know, during COVID. And that's because of the strength of movements for housing justice and because of the threat of uprising, or it's amazing to see um, all of these institutions like freaked out by the uprising against anti-Black racism and policing. And we can be like, yep, they made a lot of lip service. What has enough changed? How do we keep the fight going? They're, these are concessions. These, the answers will never come from them. Finally, obviously stakes are really high. Um, we need more people to feel those stakes and to believe that they could be part of making change. Um, okay, finally, I, I think this piece for me around, we need to be both bold and ordinary in order to meet the severe conditions we're living under. We need so many more people to be doing mutual aid work. We need to figure out how to make a ton of mutual aid projects about everything so that everyone is getting more support. I think a lot of people who are scared and upset about what's going on are pretty demobilized right now and just doing, if anything, symbolic acts. So how do we bring more people in? That's our job. Um, so we need like just a widespread, like everybody's doing this ordinary work. Everyone's part of a childcare collective or helping people getting get benefits or making sure people, you know, doing disaster relief on the block, disaster preparation. Does everybody have a mask? If the lights go out, do we have solar batteries? You know, are the old people on the block getting visited? You know, whatever. We need all of this kind of like celebrating the ordinary work, the unglamorous, beautiful work of making new ways of life and surviving. And we need bold work. We need to ramp up our bold mutual aid work. How often we can face off with the cops and get people to not be arrested. How often we can stop ICE from taking people. How we can break people out of prisons. How we can outnumber landlords, cops, how we can squat, like how we can disobey all the rules that control and extract. And so we need a lot more people in it for that too. We need a lot of people doing the ordinary work, which I think is often like the training ground for the risky work. Not everybody's gonna be down for the risky work, but the more people do it, the less risky it gets, you know, cause you just win. Um, just a few more pictures and I'll wrap up. Um, this is, so um, during the summer of 2020, when there was the uprising after the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, I, maybe some of you know, there was this kind of occupied zone in Seattle, this, or this, you know, people fought the cops in the street and then the cops left this precinct in this neighborhood Capitol Hill that I live in. And then there was this police free zone and there was all this mutual aid, like mutual aid is the infrastructure of such spaces. And so these are just like some of, you know, the no cop co-op, it's so cute. Um, this is what those zones look like they look what they look like is the mutual aid um let's see if this is going to go to the next slide um this is a 
uh, you know, in December of 2020, the cops announced they were going to raid the unhoused people still living in that park, Kelly Anderson Park. They were living in just like one part of it. And so people did this mutual aid project of going and barricading the whole area to, to block it from the cops. And they were trying to defend it. Um, I thought it was really amazing, the barricading. And then this is, of course, the city spent spending over a million dollars to raid the park, destroy people's belongings, and then you know, the cops occupy the park for many days to prevent people from going back. And they're still in various ways doing that. Uh, one more example of this, this is an image from a similar thing that happened in Philly where people um, did a public occupation and unhoused people living together and they were demanding that the city turn over all this um, uh, vacant property the city had and ultimately the city did um, uh, give the uh, housing activists 50 units of housing, which they didn't consider like a final victory. It was just like an important concession along the way. You can read about it online. Um, okay, I'm almost done. Oh, we went too far. Um, this is an image from Oakland, um, Moms for Housing, um, taking over vacant homes. Um, this is the uh, an image of the, oh, of the, of the moms who took over this space and were black moms living in this space and then people supporting them outside, guarding the space um, from the cops. So this kind of this kind of squatting type of activism, a lot of this has been happening in uh, many places and including in Oakland and Los Angeles. And then of course the heavily militarized police response um, that we see. You see, we see how high the stakes are when they send in these kinds of armored vehicles to remove um, black families from vacant property. Um, so yeah, I think I'm ready for us to move on to the q and I'm very curious to hear how this all lands on you. And um, yeah, I think we're taking a break first though, maybe. Yeah, that's perfect. So Dean, that was amazing. Thank you so much for offering that for us. Um, we are gonna take a five minute break. So it's 4.45 right now. Let's have everybody come back at 5.50, and then we're going to open up uh, the Q&As. Um, we're more than, you guys are more than welcome to answer verbally, and we can also do it in the chat. So um, let's take our break, and then we'll come back to that next section. Thanks, everybody. Oh. Um, to just start things off, I would love to ask you a question. Um, what has been some of your experiences bringing up um, these conversations with individuals that are white in specific? Because I think that this conversation um, is huge to understanding uh, white supremacy. So I would love to hear um, maybe a great moment, maybe a challenging moment or an insightful moment, because I think that that's really important to um, acknowledge that, that this is also work done on the backs of, you know, black femmes and whatnot. So I would love to pass that question to start the conversation. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, my, my take on like when I'm trying to talk to people, I feel like our job, all of our jobs is to recruit people to social movements and to recruit people into mutual aid projects and into doing deep solidarity work. And so I always try to start with something that person already cares about. So that just depends on who it is, right? Like um, some people, you know, and sometimes also if they already have touchstones, like a lot of people have experienced mutual aid type connections through their faith communities or something happened in their union when everybody had someone's back or um, something like that. So like, I think it really depends on who I'm talking to. Like definitely I have had a lot of students who are, white women who care a lot about sexual violence and gender violence and talking to them about the ways that like the systems we have now don't do anything about that or make it better, but what would, and really like teach people to think about, like learn about like what is transformative justice and what does it mean to try to build safety through community like efforts to like get people to stop doing harmful stuff to each other and to like figure out what would prevent and make people safer. Like a lot of people could understand that. Or like if I'm talking to people from like back home where I'm from in Virginia, which is like, I'm from a very like, um, like my foster family is like quite conservative Christian white people. Um, you know, I'm gonna probably use examples that they can relate to like things that have gone down with their family around losing jobs or um, being broke or, 
um, having someone in the family criminalized, you know, and like how do people come together and support people who are going through an unfair court system? A lot of them have relate to that, even if they don't know they hate the cops yet, you know? So I think for me, it's just like, whoever I'm talking to, I'm trying to figure out like, what do you already care about? That's like my recruitment strategy. And then how can we build out from there? So how can I start with what you care about? And then ask you to imagine like how it affects somebody who has some greater vulnerability than you. Um, before, you know, even before I invite you to the mutual aid group, I want you to be thinking about that because otherwise you might come there and like be harmful to others or like be unkind. And so, um, so yeah, I think that this is, you know, I live in Washington state, which is like a state in which the majority of people in prison are white, like a lot, like all this, all the like anti-black systems are also really hurting <laughs> for white people. And, and the de design is such that it's encouraging poor white people to identify with the system and not actually with their other people who are being hurt by it. And so I think that that move of like, how to get people to see real solidarity in their lives instead of like fake solidarities that are offered by the system is really essential. Also like around other power differences, like around men who are recruited to believe that like they should worship Donald Trump because they want to be someone like him who could be rich and hurt people and get away with it. And it's like, okay, how do we like re recruit them back from that to like being humans, you know? Uh, Catherine. Thanks, Liz. Um, thanks so much, Dean. That was awesome. I've um, seen some of your workshops before and they're always just um, so anyways, enough. there's not enough praise to go around. So I'm going to get to the question. Um, <laughs> in the, the book that, you know, those of us who are um, in BCS were assigned to read, so mutual, um, mutual aid. Uh, one of the topics that you touch on, but I don't think uh, touched on the, in the lecture was about care, that kind of like care work that is typically, you know, can be seen in certain realms, and especially in capitalist culture as unpaid, um, you know, women's work. Um, but how we really need to rethink about that kind of like maintenance and care work as being, um, really essential. And so there have been other thinkers um, who have thought about, you know, like wages for housework and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, but I'm wondering if, you know, you have any strategies or ways of thinking about how to start that conversation of creating value around um, maintenance and, and care work that isn't in the realm of like the financial. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah. And maybe some people know that part of what Catherine's talking about is sometimes called by feminists reproductive labor, like all the work that goes into like in, in, in kind of the way capitalism has been structured. It's like men get paid to do work and they're the wage earner. And then all this free labor has to happen behind the scenes, usually by women to like reproduce the laborer's ability to show up for work. Like you know, emotional care and sexual care and making food and making babies and caring for old people and caring for babies. And, and that work is uncompensated and, um, and undervalued and um, in, invisibilized. And then when white feminism pushed for white women to be able to go to work in that way, it further enhanced the uh, invisibilization because it's like more and more like women of color should do that work so that white women can go to work. And, um, and in general, that work has just most traditionally been done by people of color and women of color, also like men of color doing janitorial work or, but um, that kind of um, labor is like unpaid, underpaid, you know, dirty, like, you know, the sense of like diapers and trash and floors and, you know, and I think that um, it's kind of interesting that in the moment of pandemic, everyone's like, oh, that's the essential work, <laughs> you know, like, doing the dishes at the restaurant and serving the food at the restaurant, all these incredibly precarious jobs became visible as like grocery jobs, et cetera, you know, cleaning the hospital. Um, and so unfortunately it did not lead <laughs> to a transformation of our um, economy, but I do think it was an interesting opportunity. Um, I've, I've been really moved by some organizing I've seen happening. Some of it's immigrant rights organizing or immigrant justice organizing about um, the fact that so many immigrants do this kind of care work. And some of it has been this coalitional work between people with disabilities and old people who often receive care from immigrant labor forces. And that a lot of that care 
is underpaid and, and done under dangerous circumstances, like people being having to do lifts they can't really do or whatever, hurting their bodies. And it's like this, like these two groups are actually being screwed over, like the migrant labor force and the people with care needs and the system wants to leave them both in this vulnerable position. So like, how do we make solidarities between many groups that may appear opposing because it's like employer employee or something, but it's like, that's too simple. So I think there's been some really smart feminist work about that or about child care work in the same way. Um, yeah, I think that like it's deep how child care is not talked about in the United States politically as much as in many other countries. I think the pandemic has changed that some, but yeah, I feel like we just have to like do exactly what you did in your question. Like just constantly talk about these forms of work and the conditions under which they happen and, and then just do the actual mutual aid work together about them, right? I mean, people like sex workers have always like, have been doing mutual aid work to organize, to survive, doing criminalized labor together forever, you know, and, um, and so many other, you know, moms, uh, you know, have, like in, poor moms, like do it, you know, or people whose kids are all getting swept up in the child uh, welfare slash family regulation system, you know, so just like, I think all those organizing and mutual aid projects that happen at those sites, like about child care, about um, sex work or people organizing together in um, in those job sites, like because they are all home care workers or they're all um, cleaning the hospital, like all of that, I think like that organizing feels like it does that. It does, it, it does like, we're not trying to change like what people think about this. We're trying to change the conditions and that will change what people think about it. You know what I mean? And so I think the organizing for me feels like the, the method. And then when that organizing is in solidarity, like if those people who are organizing around childcare are working with the transit riders union and also they're all working with the people who are you know trying to get the cops in seattle to stop training in israel like you know the more solidarities we build the ultimately for us to win anything we all have to have each other's backs we all have to kind of be specializing deeply in something we're working on and also showing up for everything because we just the only thing we have is numbers you know they have all the guns and money so so to me it feels like that work you're talking about like which is the bulk of the work of society is that reproductive labor. I mean, it's kind of, it's like capitalism is so magical and white supremacy that it can make us not perceive that. It's like shocking, you know? Um, but I think that uh, to me, organizing and mobilizing is the, is the way that we, that people have lived that to the surface. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, next, Chloe placed a, a question in the chat. I'm going to read it out loud for us. Um, I really love the video series, Building Accountability, Building Accountable Communities. Uh, and what really stuck out to me is how to hold those who do harm accountably. While I believe no human belongs in captivity, I am wondering if there are any mutual aid groups working on how to address uh, those who commit violent crimes and what they are proposing. I'd assume it comes down to rehabilitation, but something that comes up in this series is that those are that those individuals in place, um, that those are the individuals in a place and that they are able to receive rehabilitation. Thanks for that question, Chloe. That's a really great question. So yeah, that I really recommend that video series. Um, it's also from the Barnard Center for Research on Women. And it's a bunch of interviews with people who are very deep in the work that is called transformative justice. What that work is, is, is a, it's a type of mutual aid work, in my opinion, that is focused on developing ways for people to be safe and address harm in their communities without ever using the police. So there's a lot of different parts of that work. Like one whole part of transformative justice work is work to prevent that harm. So like if most trans people who get like beaten and killed in the street would have been safer if they had housing, then the work is to get housing for trans people, right? Like prevent, like so much, if, if, we, if we all just in this room thought about everybody we know who's experienced violence and all the times we've experienced violence, we could be like, what would have prevented it? I needed a place to live that wasn't with my parents. I needed a ride that night. I needed um, 
I needed people to call out the fact that this person in my church or in my organization was just kept abusing people and everyone protected him. You know, like, what is it that we need? What are the conditions that prevent these opportunities for violence? Like, that's just huge. Like, first and foremost, the violence in our society isn't really about like some bad people. It's about like being put in situations where we don't have a way out um, and a way to make the choices that would make us be safer. So like, that's one big piece of it is the prevention work that includes things like groups that do like, um, you know, healthy dating skills workshops in high schools to help people like, like, like learn about how to like rely on their friends and stay safer or like groups that are trying to like change people's like change men's views about sexuality and sexism so that they can not, you know, um, uh, engage in sexual violence so frequently as they do, you know, like groups that are trying to like really be in specific subcultures or some age groups or communities or schools and like get at the root causes of rape culture, you know, like that kind of work. Right. So that's, that's huge. All the preventative work to like change our culture where we don't like, like just let people do this to each other and have it be completely endemic, which it is right. This kind of violence. Um, a second kind of work is, um, is responding to when things actually happen. So like we're in an organization together and I keep sexually harassing people in the organization. Like what should people in the organization do? Like, you know, maybe I'm the founder, I've been there a long time. People don't really wanna question me. Other people are younger than me or something. I'm popular, whatever the power dynamics where I'm just getting away with this, you know? And so lots of people have done all of this really creative um, work to figure out like how can groups of people respond and be like, hey, Dean, cut it out. Like, what do I need to stop doing it? I might need something like drug treatment because I really do this when I'm wasted, but it, I might also need something like, Dean, you're not allowed to be the leader of this group anymore because you keep doing this to people. This is how you're using your leadership. You know, like, but basically how can we use the fact that we're all these social animals and that we are really in groups and need each other to like help figure out what a person needs to do to cut it out and what the people they hurt need in order to like be able to participate again, like not be permanently stigmatized, not feel like I can't ever go to the meeting or the party or whatever again. Like we can never make it that this never happened to them, but how can we make it so that they feel supported and believed in their community and, um, and they know people are taking care of making this thing stop. You know, like this stuff is not happening. The, the police and cr criminal system doesn't do any of this. You know, it just like, mostly does nothing about violence. Most of us don't even report what happens to us because it's such an untrustworthy, useless system. Or it is this thing that's harming us. The cops harassed me, the cops raped me, the cops locked me in the car, whatever. Or it's, um, uh, you know, exacerbates it. Like, oh, then I just went and got traumatized in prison for two years and now I'm back out and I'm hurting my former partner again. You know, like, I mean, so, so anyway, we're trying to do this is very, transformative justice is very pragmatic. It's like, how do we prevent this stuff from happening? When it happens, how do we, get it to stop and help people who were harmed. And then the third piece is like, how do we assess the conditions as a community to be like, why did that happen? Can we make it not happen again? Oh, those people need housing or, oh, those people need rides. Or, um, you know, when we set up organizations like that, it makes people be able to just keep abusing the young people in the organization. I mean, th this stuff has patterns. At this point, we all know what the patterns are, unfortunately, right? And so, um, so the thing about this question is it's like, it's, this is all less about like those bad people who do those bad things. I mean, and also there's, I think a lot of misunderstanding in our culture. Like, for example, all the evidence shows that people who have murdered someone are the least likely to ever do it again. Like if I, if I, I'm most likely to really hurt someone who's like my, probably my sexual or like romantic partner, my kid, maybe someone at my job. Like we mostly hurt people that we know really well and we do it under conditions of extreme stress. And that doesn't actually mean I'm likely to do it again. TV is full of images of serial killers and serial rapists. Like those stories have to circulate to justify this like wildly huge system of criminalization. But that's not mostly how violence works. And I think you all know this. You get hurt by people who are like at your school or in your family or in your church or whatever. And so the solutions become very different. It's like, and, and people often do that stuff because that's how I was told sexuality worked or that's how I, I was told I could treat people like that if they were my kid or that's what happened to me. That's like a lot of it. Like that's how my parents treated me. That's how I'm gonna treat you, you know? Um, and so we have to like interrupt that stuff. So it's really about looking at root causes instead of kind of getting fixated on, on dangerous individuals. And it's like, 
if there's no room for it to happen, people mostly don't do it. It's because it's acceptable in this social circle to sexually assault people when they're drunk. That's why I did it. Or it's because it's acceptable in this church to, you know, so, um, so I think a lot of this is about like really changing social norms and, and that's done through organizing, like transformative justice work is organizing work. I hope that's useful. And yeah, I really recommend those videos. I recommend all the work of Miriam Kaba as a person to read about this. I recommend um, the book, The Color of Violence. It's a classic anthology on this matter, um, edited by Insight. And there's another um, one called The Revolution Starts at Home that's really useful. Um, there's a great book by, um, um, a Jiris Dix Dixon, a, a, recent, uh, a recent anthology by Jiris Dixon and another author. There's so many great things about this, but you can find a lot of those resources on that Building Accountability Communities website. Um, and I, I think one more thing I'll mention, Miriam Kaba has a newish project called like A Million Experiments, it's a website. And it's like, it's just like about all things people are trying to create more safety. Like one example that I learned about on that website is like this project to bring people into barbershops who want to do mental health support. So like, you know, a lot of men are not going to go to therapy, you know, for a lot of reasons, like it's hard to find culturally competent therapy or in your language, or, you know, you've been told that means you're weak or whatever, but um, a lot of people hang out in barbershops and sometimes open up with other men and could get emotional support. And if people had enough emotional support, they might act different at home or at their jobs if people could talk to somebody and someone could say, dude, don't say that about your wife. That's not cool. That might actually like, like social pressure matters. So just even, or like, oh, you are really in crisis and you know, this could turn for you into like problem drinking or it could, you need a friend, you know, like breaking people's isolation is like number one for safety. Most of us who, when we've been hurt, we were somehow isolated. Or if you get hurt and you're isolated, it's much more traumatizing than if you get hurt and you have a support system and people believe you and care for you afterwards. So a lot of these kind of experiments are things like that, that are like, let's sort of deprofessionalize support. Let's get more people to be more supported more of the time. And then maybe people won't like do harmful things um, or harmful things won't hurt people as bad. I have another question for you, actually, just as we're here. Um, I'm wondering, like, what your take on is about, like, the performity involved with social justice on the internet, specifically Instagram. Um, I think we've had some really great generative conversations over the last few semesters about that specifically, and how um, it's not really necessarily making change, but um, I do see actually like a lot of mutual aid intersecting into that conversation too. So um, I'd be really curious to hear what you think about um, the kind of problematized nature of social media and mutual, and I'll quote, I'll say mutual aid because I don't know if that's exactly how we would describe it on the internet. Yeah, I think that um, the, I think that internet, so I think social media can be used to mobilize or demobilize like any tool. And all the tools we have, like our computers and all the surveillance tools, we should assume that they are all designed for capitalist extraction and military use. And if and so we should first and foremost think that they're not naturally radical or liberating. <laughs> and we might use them because we live in a society which is dependent on them. And then we should use them thoughtfully. And so to me, um, at its best, social media is a place where people are learning ideas that they that are exciting for them. Like, it, you know, I came out as a trans person when social media didn't exist. And I think it took me longer to learn certain things that I could learn now more easily, even if I was geographically isolated. There's like some cool stuff like that, you know, or people connecting who have disabilities, who have a hard time mobilizing to connect in person. You know, there's some beautiful ways it can break isolation and it can build isolation. It can, it's very individualized. It's about building your brand. It's about appearing to care about certain things or have certain politics. It's about taking other people down in order to show that you're more down. So those are some of the um, ways that it can be harmful. So I think we have to use it with caution. I think that there has been a ton of, you know, proliferation of mutual aid projects, um, especially since the beginning of the pandemic and the rebellion. Um, you know, people just tons of people giving to bail funds and, you know, people doing, you know, 
raising money for workers who are cut out of the benefits and um, all kinds of stuff. And that is great. And if it's just getting people to donate, then it's not bringing them very far up the ramp towards mobilization. We want a lot of people to have thick contact with social with social movements, to be actively engaged and less isolated. So if I only click on things and send money, it's not like I've done nothing, but will anyone visit me when I'm sick? When I'm in a DB relationship, will I have anyone to turn to? When I'm thinking about killing myself, will anyone call me? You know, maybe not. So how do we... So a lot of the groups I work with that I've done a lot of that kind of mutual aid fundraising, I'm like, well, how do you turn up the connection with those people? What are we going to do to have those people like maybe meet in person where they live regionally or how are we you know, like, what does it take to make more of us have more contact and more people in our lives? Because the other side of social media and the internet, of course, is that it's like all this entertainment stuff and we just are like zoning out while like the world's on fire. So how do we find, you know, I, it's, I, I think it's not like it's good or bad. It's just like, it's a big part of our lives. How do we play it and not get played by it? It was like kind of the question. That's an excellent response. Cause I am always wondering, it's a balance. It's never one thing. It lives on a spectrum. So you definitely answered it in that way. So we have two more questions and I think we might have some time for a third question if anybody else wants to hop in. Uh, Jackie is first and then after that'll be Martha. I put my hand down before I forget. Thanks so much. I just was thinking about, you know, your profession as a lawyer, as an attorney, and working in teaching the law to other people. Um, and I definitely take what you say about, you know, the law shows us what it is for, which is to control us. And I just wonder, because, you know, so much of what we write and think about, whether it's in publications or in lectures, etc., is obvious. And yet, things don't change nearly as fast enough as you would think. It's, you say to somebody, this is wrong and you know it's wrong, <laughs> and but it doesn't work like that. So I was just wondering about thinking about different ways that law school could be different because so much of law school is about communication and language. That's why they tell you, you can major in history or in English and be in a good candidate to go to law school. But I mean, I just wonder, cause you know, like, it, it, uh, it, we understand something, for instance, about critical race theory. It's pointing something out about the law, and yet so many people are like, oh, well, I'm not going to vote for that reform. So I'm just wondering for you as a, a scholar of the law, can you see a different framework for legal training for law school? That's such a good question. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, yeah, so I mean, um, I, my take on US law is that it is designed to produce, you know, white supremacy, wealth concentration, et cetera. And it is not a tool for liberation. And we need people to be, we need some people to be lawyers and to be doing policy work and to be all, all of those things because those systems are devouring our people. So we do want, like, you know, we do want some people to train to be hopefully abolitionist public defenders or you know, people defending people who are being evicted or whatever. I personally discourage people from going to law school because so many people want to do that because it's kind of an elitist way to like join the work, but most of them will actually be sucked into like corporate law and other things. Like very few people will actually go on to do that because there's very few jobs paid to do that. And you go into $300,000 of debt to go to law school. So I think it's, I think the law school, like most graduate school is designed to neutralize people's radical potential and that most people would be better off just organizing for those three years and they could probably prevent more evictions and more arrests that way. So that's my personal belief. Why do I teach in law school? Because I need a job. I didn't want to be a lawyer anymore because being a lawyer, poverty lawyer is just telling people like, yeah, you have no path to immigration. Yeah, you can't, you know, we're going to lose here. We're going to lose. I, I just was like, why am I delivering the state's news to people? I was and filling out forms and then sometimes winning something for somebody who had like the best case scenario when I believe we should start with people with the worst situations. So I was like, I don't want that job, which is a million hours a week anymore. And being a professor is like a much easier job than being a poverty lawyer. And it gives me more time to do what I really believe in, which is unpaid work, including mutual aid work. Um, I try to teach my students to think critically about the system that they're being told to just swallow and believe. Like they're being told to read the law and believe what it says. And I'm like, don't believe what the law says about itself and what white judges believe say about it. Like what, what's it look like on the ground? Do the cops, does having Miranda rights matter in a police state? No, like, you know, just try to think about it. Like, so 
which is what I think critical race theory does exactly as you said. It asks us to regard the law from the perspective of the people who are subject to it, not from what it says about itself. So I, I hope that's useful. <laughs> like I hope I'm useful to radicalize my students and make them into abolitionists and stuff. Who knows? You know, they're already like kind of older and very career focused. And so it's a mixed bag. It's definitely easier post 2020 and more of them are getting, you know, radical. Um, but I, if I was going to change law school, I've thought about this a lot because mostly I think it should be abolished, but if I was going to change it, I might make it more of an explicit training ground where you would be studying, it would, it would just be for people who wanted to, you know, destroy the United States. And it would be like, you'd study how the legal system has how exactly has it produced white supremacy, wealth concentration, and um, colonialism? And you'd study resistant tactics to it and what the counter moves have been. And so you might be like, yeah, we're going to welfare hearings, but we're actually going to do a rent strike. We're going to do some of the more militant tactics instead of that case by case individual, which is a way that the law manages poor people's rebellion. And so instead of it being like, we'll do your bankruptcy hearing, then we'll do your bankruptcy hearing, then we'll do what you'd be like, we're all going on a plea strike in the criminal system and we're going to crash the system down. No one's going to plea out. Everyone's going to go to trial or no, you know, whatever. So, you know, we would be using more militant tactics, which some lawyers sometimes use, but, um, and we would have lawyers be like technical assistants to social movement actors like, oh yeah, like we're going to help you go through the red tape and figure out where this decision is being made or, you know, whatever, like lawyers can have a role as just like specialists, just like nurses have a role and, you know, people who know how to make really big sculptures have a very important role in social movements or whatever. Um, but, but not, um, what we have now, which is like lawyers often like run nonprofits and they like that are based on like a theory that if we changed the law, we would free people. And it's just like, it's just like liberal nonsense. I mean, I agree with what you said that like, to, to me, what I, one of the things I heard in the first part of what you said is that we, there's a, there's a liberal myth of education in this society. If people only knew everything would change. And that only makes sense if you actually think we live in a democracy, which of course we don't. So like, yeah, all of us who are in social movements, we just say the same truths over and over and over again our whole lives because it's a matter of organizing. It's not a matter of the truth being out there. Like all the truth is out there, but people are still intentionally like trapped in situations that are demobilizing or exploitative. So it's like, how do we get conditions under which people act collectively towards our shared best interest? Like it's not easy. But it's there's so much more to it than just the right ideas. Um, I think, as you were really pointing out, it's a great question. Thank you. All right, and then we have Martha's question. And just to be mindful of everyone's time, that might be the last question we have time for. Sure. Thank you. I am very fortunate. I live in New York City in Manhattan, and our neighborhood has put up a couple mutual aid efforts one is a free store and one is a community cupboard and it's all happened within this year and we have an enormous amount of really dedicated people that go out and pick up food and deliver it to the cupboard and monitor and clean the free store and make sure that we don't get kicked out of the storefront uh, though there's been an argument, not an argument, I don't know how to say this, but there's been a little consternation, let's say that, where uh, a lot of the very hardworking people are upset with the fact that they will, they'll put all this food in the cupboard, for instance, and someone will come and take all of it, even though we have a, a a reminder, leave what you can, take what you need. And it happens in the free store too. Something's dropped off and there's these people that just live there and they take everything. And the workers are having a problem with it and that uh, I, we've all learned that people who are in food insecure never know if they're going to have another meal. They don't know if the cupboard's going to be filled and they'll come back another time. And so there, you know, there's an anxiety that they, you know, while I have it, let me take as much as I can. Um, and I'm concerned that these people, because there was an argument and we have a group chat and this person was talking about the principles of, of mutual aid and this woman who volunteers, she put so much time and said, I disagree. And I'm like, oh no, we don't want to lose her because she's upset with the situations that that's happening that and it seems like there's a, the same people cleaning the 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 place out um 
and so what do you say, you know, like, is there anything else that we could offer? Because I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a founder, I'm a worker, but uh, we have regular meetings and I'm pretty um, vocal at them about, you know, ideas that we could do. If, is there anything I could take back to the community that would help out here? Yeah, thank you for doing that work. I think that's a great question. I think this happens in a lot of mutual aid projects. Like the level of the level of unevenness of power and resources that we live under produces this. You know, like it it, it makes it just as you said, people are just like, oh my God. I mean, obviously rich people hoard everything. And we all think that's totally natural. Of course, the more people hoard things, it's like, you know, very noticeable um, because it's so rare they have the opportunity to. But this is like a very um it's a, it's a reasonable response to the conditions we live under. And I think that like the main things for groups to do about it, I love that you guys aren't punishing people or saying you can never come back to the free store, all those things. Those are the, the most central like prison like moves we would do. The real move is relationship building. It's just like, like figuring out like how to have more people at the free store more often to really have a conversation with people about like what they need and why it feels that way. It's like, and maybe that person needs to take like as much as they can carry. And like, we're just going to let that happen, but we're just going to also just like, what would it take for this person to feel safe? They might need to be able to take as much as they can carry for three years straight. Does that mean we just need to get more of that stuff and like, let them do that? Does it, does this person, are we going to try out like, oh, maybe we'll try out like Having someone like stand there and hand it out and everybody gets two. You can also do that. That's that can be a non-putative way to do it. A lot more labor, a lot more time. But like I think a lot of groups are just experimenting with it. But if the spirit of the experiment is like compassion and love for everybody who's coming through and non-punishment, like, and then the goal is also abundance. Like, how can we not go into scarcity mode about either the amount of time people have or the amount of you know, supplies we have. Yeah. That's really key because yeah, some people are going to do that. I mean, I have to tell you my, my boyfriend's mom, like she goes to the food bank and just brings us all this stuff. And I'm like, we don't go to the food bank. You qualify for the food bank. We do not please stop hoarding the food from the food bank and bring it to our house. But she cannot stop. And she's been through so much trauma in her life. And it's just like, in the end, I'm like, this probably isn't going to make or break the food bank, but like, it's really hard. I'm just like, I don't know what it's going to, I don't know if she will ever feel emotionally safe enough to not do some of these actions she does that are specifically around taking too much stuff from various free piles, you know, and it's rough, you know, and I just think like, so this is going to be a common thing we'll see. So I think the question just becomes like, how does, how do you just administer the mutual aid project in a way that's as pragmatic as possible, knowing that this is a constant, you know, and I think that could be either having more people so that you can hand things out a certain amount of time or, relationship both ideally relationship building like a lot of times if people who are coming to use a mutual aid project are brought into working in it too like people are so isolated so it's like a lot of people would love to have something to do if, mm -hmm. they, if it was really friendly and loving not everybody some people it's not their bag they don't need to do it but like that's another way and it's like oh why don't you come help us run it and then maybe you'll have a different take on you know how many of those anyone should take or not maybe you never maybe you don't want to talk to anyone here and that's fine but I think that like that combination of, of cultivating abundance and relationship building is kind of the only repeated answer. And we may never get out of that dynamic in our lifetimes, given the thousands of years it took to get to this like warp place that we are. Yeah, yeah, thank you. In fact, that was what we were thinking with the, the, the cupboard is newer and that we were getting buttons made that say, ask us about the cupboard and, and that we would not just drop off the food and leave, but we'd all take an hour of time to be there to educate people so that thank you thanks that really reinforces that and we need to do something similar for the free store so thank you for that great well that concludes uh today's forum thank you so much dean spade and thanks everyone for making this possible um we're very excited and if anybody wants to re-watch this this will be recorded and on the cca site um, and thank you again, Dean. Everything's been really wonderful. It's so great to have you.